everybody. Good afternoon. Nice to see so many folks here. My name is Maria Flynn, and I'm the president and CEO of Jobs for the Future. And it's my honor to moderate this session with three friends of mine who I've known for quite a while in different roles um, to talk about federal policy and how three federal agencies, education, commerce, and labor, are really working together to promote President Biden's um, ambitious agenda around equity and economic advancement. Uh, so with me today, I have Jen Missouri, who is with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Career and Technical and Adult Education, OCTE. And so that's the agency that administers programs such as Perkins and Adult Education. She's the chief of staff there and currently also has the designated, the delegated duties of the assistant secretary. Michelle Chang is with the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, Economic Development Agency, and she is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy. Uh, they have, uh, she'll talk about really the expanded kind of role that they have right now implementing a lot of new um, programs that are very relevant to the conversation today. And we have Angela Hanks, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, which is the agency I worked at for uh, over 16 years earlier in my career, so very near and dear to my heart. Um, but just to get us started, I think just to really kind of get us situated in terms of how each of these agencies kind of come together to promote equity and to promote opportunities for learners and workers. Let me just start by talking a bit about, you know, kind of how does your agency kind of fit into this picture? What is, you know, an element of the Biden agenda that you're particularly um, enthusiastic about. And Angela, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Maria, and thanks to JFF for having me here today. I'm very excited to be on this panel with my fellow colleagues. I was just saying um, earlier, Michelle and I actually have uh, not met in person ever. <laughs> uh, it took us coming to California to meet, even though we technically work down the street from one another, but we talk all the time. So I'm um, really glad to be here today. Um, so I think there are many things that, that we're excited about, and I think uh, I'll, I'll just say a few things up top, and then I, uh, I'm sure my uh, panelists will elaborate uh, a bit more. So, as you all may know, one of the first things that the president did um, on day one when he uh, came into office was sign the executive order advancing racial equity. Um, you know, I think this is a really important step, in part because you know I, I think it's very easy for an executive order that the president signs on his first day to seem like symbolic or like it's a gesture toward equity. Um, but this has really been an active document in all of our agencies in shaping the way that we do the work. Um, equity is at the core of everything that we do at ETA, at the Department of Labor, for the Secretary, for the Deputy Secretary, and for the Secretaries um, at Ed and Commerce as well. Um, and it really does guide the way that we do everything from our grant making uh, to our uh, monitoring activities uh, to uh, the way that we engage with our team and our staff. And so I just wanted to say that up front because I really do think that has been uh, a, a bit of a North Star for us as we've developed our work. So some of the things that we're doing specifically, um, I'll just name a few. So as you all know, um, Last year, I think it was just a little over a year ago, uh, the president signed the American Rescue Plan Act, um, which did a number of things, including making some major investments that I know Michelle will talk about in just a bit. Um, but for, for us at the Department of Labor, it also included some investments in uh, modernizing unemployment insurance, which you all know um, has really been a cornerstone of our recovery uh, over the last two years. And so as we've been working through our um, uh, unemployment sh insurance plans, some of what we've been doing is really centering equity in that work, uh, something that we saw during the pandemic was that people, um, not enough people had access to benefits. Um, we saw that marginalized groups have too little access and were not often uh, receiving them at the same rates as, as some of their other counterparts. And so we've made grants to, um, so far, eight states, but we're hoping to get all of them. Uh, uh, equity grants to states and unemployment insurance that we're very excited about. On the workforce side, we have a number of investments that I'm very excited to talk about in more detail, but I'll just highlight a few. Um, so we have a number of grants to the Department of Labor that go toward uh, investing in uh, education and training programs uh, at the local level uh, to serve a range of participants. Some of those uh, investments focus on different groups, such as young people, uh, formerly incarcerated, uh, dislocated workers. Um, but really, as we have been making those grants and focusing on shaping those uh, 
funding opportunities this year, we have made equity a core focus. So for an example, um, we have a Strengthening Community Colleges grant that's open for solicitation right now. This really builds the infrastructure at community colleges to pr provide high quality workforce training programs, and we're prioritizing equity in those grants. So some of what that looks like is we are um, awarding bonus points for uh, consortia that include minority serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities. Um, we're naming equity as a priority um, throughout the grant and focusing on the types of services that we know uh, will lead to equity, whether that is pre-apprenticeship or um, access to supportive services, um, but truly we are centering equity in those grants. Similarly, um, in our investments in our reentry programs, in apprenticeship, um, we are making equity a cornerstone of what we're doing. So I'll talk about, about this more later, but our Apprenticeship Building America funding announcement, which is out right now, um, offers a host of ways that um, applicants can make investments, but we are really focused on building equity partnerships, uh, building pathways for communities that have not typically engaged in uh, registered apprenticeship programs or in the higher wage registered apprenticeship programs like construction. Um, and really, again, we are trying to use those investments uh, to drive that change, to drive the equity that we want to see in the labor market. So I will stop there, because I know we're gonna talk much more about this and turn it over to my colleagues, but um, I think I can say on behalf of all of us that we're very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you today and to do this work every day, because we do think that it's important to help reshape the labor market and push us toward an equitable recovery. That's great. Yeah, I love the tangible examples, right, of kind of the through line between executive order language and then what actually changes in a like grant solicitation. That's really, that's great. So Michelle, things you wanna highlight? Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me on the panel. It's so nice to see people in 3D and not on a Zoom screen. <laughs> so, um, I definitely echo a lot of what Angela said. As she mentioned, the president made equity such an important part of his agenda. And we at the Economic Development Administration at the Department of Commerce, we followed suit. Soon after that happened in April of last year, we revised what we call our investment priorities. These are the principles that we follow for all of our grant giving. So we at the Economic Development Administration are primarily a grant giving organization. That's our primary programming is to provide grants. And we're at a really unique opportunity right now. We receive $3 billion in the American Rescue Plan Act, which is tenfold our normal budget. And so it's been a really exciting time for us to really think about how we can invest in communities across our country, particularly in an equitable way. And so as we think about that, one of the priorities that we are making is to ensure that all of our investments have an equity lens. And so we're really focused on prioritizing projects that are focused on underserved populations, as well as underserved communities. And that's really the cornerstone of what we're doing right now. And it really, like Angela said, it's really something that we think about in everything we do by explicitly saying it, it's forcing us to think really deeply about everything from who we're doing outreach to, who we're partnering with strategically, but also how we're designing our programs to be mindful of potential barriers that underserved communities that may face and making sure we're being mindful of that and how we design programs. But then also on evaluation, that's something that we've been looking at very carefully as we're getting grant applications in. We're being really thoughtful of making equity an explicit evaluation criteria, but also thinking about who's evaluating our applications and making sure we're bringing a diverse set of folks to do that. And so that's one thing I wanted to highlight. I think the second thing I really want to highlight too is workforce development, which is something I know is really um, important for this audience here today. And it's something that the Economic Development Administration at Department of Commerce has invested in, but we are doing it in a different way than we have before. And so I'll talk a bit more about this later, but we're really excited right now. We are currently in the middle of running a $500 million workforce development focused program called the Good Jobs Challenge. And this is all about helping get workers who have been either displaced or underemployed during the pandemic, get the skills that they need to be able to secure good quality jobs. And as a Department of Commerce, we do see it as our responsibility to take really an employer focus to that. And so we are really prioritizing projects that are demand driven, employer driven, and have strong employer engagement and commitment to be able to secure good quality jobs for American workers. Um, and thank you again for, for being here. I'm excited to also see you all in person. Um, I think a lot of um, a lot of what my colleagues shared already resonates for how we've been thinking about things at the Department of Education. Um, and you know, the secretary says this um, so often, we really can't go back um, to the strategies that we're not working um, and that we're not serving um, students in the way that they should have been. And so we've really taken that to heart across the Department of Education, across our K-12 work, our higher education work, our work to support adult learners. 
Um, and just to give a couple of concrete examples um, on how we're thinking about equity within our existing programs and our proposals, um, for example, when we're thinking about some work that my office focuses a lot on around dual enrollment and um, thinking about how um, which students have access to dual enrollment and which students do not, um, and how we need to be learning from the field um, and looking to states and localities that are doing a good job of providing these quality opportunities to students and then um, lifting those examples up and working with places that are not doing that. So that's something that we're gonna be focusing on quite a bit over the next few months and, and the next few years and more to come on that. Um, in higher education more broadly, um, we've been really focused on ensuring that we're supporting all institutions throughout the recovery, but in particular looking at um, public colleges, looking at community colleges, looking at HBCUs, looking at the schools that have been, uh, that have uh, have been historically under-resourced um, and are also receiving um, you know, less support than they have in decades prior. And making sure that as we're building our plans to support students at those institutions, um, that we are really focused on equity in doing so and making sure that those inclusive colleges, the ones that are really <clears throat> inviting people onto their campuses, are receiving our support. So for example, um, when we, in our proposals around college completion, um, we, had a, we have a big proposal around um, uh, supporting institutions in their completion efforts, particularly at those inclusive colleges, and making sure that they have the resources and support they need to support their students on campuses. And finally, um, I just wanted to mention something because I don't think it gets enough attention, but something that my office really focuses on um, is actually correctional education. And we have a big focus on ensuring, so over the next, um, in 2023, we're going to see um, an expansion of Pell Grants um, to uh, more incarcerated students at eligible prison education programs. Um, and that's something that um, we're really excited to implement and I think is another example of this is a huge priority for our agency, for my office. Um, and that's something that we'll see over the next year and a half. We're thinking big about how we can support these students and provide, again, those equitable pathways um, for those students going forward. Related to that, um, if that's an area that folks are interested in at JFF, we're running a Ready for Pell initiative that Ascendium is funding, and we have a network of colleges and educational providers that we're engaging in that work to get ready for 2023. Absolutely. So, um, so when I was at, at DOL many years ago, I you know, really enjoyed the work that I did working cross-agency, particularly with the Department of Education uh, back then, and I know the three of you have been doing a lot of that, and under challenging circumstances, not being able to do it in person and at a time when you're, you know, we're trying to come out of a pandemic and economic crisis and little things like that. So just curious though, you know, um, how does that play out? Like how are you working together? And I know it's not just these three agencies, but Department of Transportation and others, like what does that look like, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm, I'm happy to start and just, I mean, so we work together all the time. Um, we actually, the three of us are on a weekly call. Uh, it's one of my favorite half hours of the week. Um, and, you know, that's critical because as you can hear, there's so much overlap. Um, and this is something also that I think our, all of our, all three of our secretaries have really made clear as a priority to make sure that we're collaborating, um, you know, in making sure that we're building um, uh, an education and training system that is comprehensive and holistic and we're really um, partners in this work. And of course, then that makes it clearer and easier and more functional for the public um, when we have kind of a joint message and a joint plan. So, you know, this is everything from thinking about joint webinars on topics where we have overlapping focus. So we just did a webinar recently on work-based learning because we have both the labor and the Department of Education perspective. Um, we're working together to amplify um, teacher apprenticeships um, to deal with some of the issues around um, the need for more teachers. Um, we have shared outreach strategies. Um, we have shared definitions across programs. Um, and we're really sort of thinking holistically about things like um, the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law um, and how we as agencies that work on workforce development and education and training can then also partner with other agencies. I'm sure my colleagues are gonna talk a bit about that. Um, and then, you know, more broadly, the three of us work together quite a bit, but we're also working with agencies um, across the government to make sure that we have sort of a whole of government approach. So one, one really good example um, that I, I've been really passionate and excited about um, is making sure that the students that we serve, particularly 
um, you know, across, of course, um, K-12, higher education, and adult education, but looking at some of those adult learners and adult students um, who often um, are going to school at a time when they have kids and they have childcare needs and they're taking away from you know, their work day to go to school and making, making sure that they're holistically supported with um, some of the basic needs so that they can pay for housing and food and, and, and others. So we're working with agencies across the federal government to make sure that um, our policies are aligned to help those students. Um, we just launched a webinar series. We started wor working with USDA. We're gonna do one with the FCC to talk about um, the benefits that may be out there to help those students and make sure that our institutions of higher education know what's going on. So there's a lot of cross-agency efforts. Um, I'd say it has not stopped during the pandemic. Um, and um, we've, been, we've been really focused on making sure we have a whole of government approach to all of the challenges as we build back and recover from this pandemic. And I'll just highlight, obviously, echo everything Jen said, and it is great to not be on a Zoom screen with them and actually see them in person. <laughs> but I'll just highlight one thing that I think particularly was helpful to us at the Department of Commerce. As I mentioned, we started really thinking about workforce development in a very different way than we have in the past. Our secretary, Secretary Raimondo, is a strong proponent of workforce development, it's something that she really wanted to prioritize coming in. And it's something that as Department of Commerce, we've done a little bit in, but what was really helpful as we were designing the program was to get the expertise and the experience from our colleagues from labor and education. And so that's kind of the ways that we're working together and being able to collaborate. We can benefit from the stakeholders that labor works with. They've been able to connect us with folks from labor unions. Education's been able to connect us with the community college community to make sure we're thinking about this and really learning from best practices and lessons learned from other workforce development programs that have been run. And for what we've seen is that there's such a strong demand for this type of program. We are gonna award $500 million. We received over 500 applications totaling $12 billion. And so there's a huge demand for workforce development out there. And so that's why it's so important that we continue to work together and support each other because we know there's a huge demand. Um, I should mention, I am not part of the selection process at all for this program, but um, <laughs> I had to work that in. Um, but I, I also just wanna highlight one other thing. As much as we all work together, I just wanna highlight that we at the Economic Development Administration also have a specific um, department that's called our Economic Development Integration Team. Their sole job is to coordinate amongst federal agencies. We are the sole agency in the federal government that focuses on economic development. And so we want to make sure that we are integrating that across the federal government. And so we have a team that works with all the different federal agencies, not just the ones you see up here, but across the entire federal government as well. So I'll just echo what my colleagues have said. I think for our agencies in particular, um, there's a lot of areas of natural alignment. Um, of course, it's still important that we talk to each other to make sure that those connections actually happen. Um, and I think we feel pretty good about the fact that they do. But um, for, for us, you know, whether it's getting commerce's expertise on employers or economic development or the Department of Education's expertise on higher education institutions, um, we really do look to our colleagues quite a bit for that um, advice and technical expertise. Um, one thing I did want to, to quickly hit on as well, since Jen mentioned the infrastructure law, um, this is an area where I can say, I think this is true for DOL and maybe for Ed too, um, we're not explicitly named in the law, but we actually see ourselves as uh, major partners in uh, uh, ensuring that implementation on the ground is successful. Um, and part of that is the type of collaboration that we're talking about here today. So one of the things that we've been doing at the department to facilitate that with the agencies that frankly, um, we don't necessarily have as natural of a connection to as we do at InCommerce um, is launching um, something called the Good Jobs Initiative that the secretary announced in January. Um, Yes, there's a lot of good jobs talk. We love job quality in the administration, so you'll hear a lot of that. But, um, but there are sort of three purposes of that initiative. So one uh, is direct engagement with workers, making sure that they know their rights, um, uh, and directly connecting with them on a variety of issues. Uh, two is similarly connecting with employers, making sure that they understand their rights and responsibilities to workers, um, and working with them to um, provide training and uh, resources as needed. And then the third part, which I think is really important to this conversation, um, is being a technical expert to federal 
uh, fellow federal agencies. So as you heard from my colleagues, um, you know, at the Department of Labor, we know what we know, but we don't really necessarily know what the Departments of Commerce or Transportation or Infrastructure or Energy, or en Infrastructure or Energy, uh, know about the programs that they run. And so it's really critical for us to be able to collaborate and share our expertise, but also learn from them as well. And so um, this is engagement that we've done, long done. Um, Maria, I'm sure this is something that you also did at the department, is working with colleagues at Transportation, Energy, and otherwise. But um, we wanted to make sure to sort of formalize those partnerships so, you know, whether it's DOT or DOE or EPA, um, they can come to us as they're writing uh, funding announcements, as they're writing uh, solicitations for contracts and say, how do we embed equity? How do we embed job quality? How do we think about workforce development? Uh, how do we think about um, work pay, uh, avoiding workplace violations? Um, whatever issues that we cover at the department. Um, and I think we've really seen that as a, a really effective way uh, to facilitate that collaboration across government because, as Jen said, this is really a whole government approach, uh, both when it comes to uh, implementation of Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, but really uh, for all of our work across the uh, government especially when it comes to embedding equity in our work. Yeah, I saw an announcement recently, I think it was from the FDA, around some of their food processing grants, and it was great because they made a reference back to DOL and the good jobs work there. So it was nice to see like the connections being made. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to kind of go into two things. One, to talk about what are the initiatives and some of the key funding opportunities that are available now, so that where Congress has already appropriated the funding. And then we'll do a second round where we talk about what are the things that are kind of key things pending before Congress, like the things that the administration is really pushing to happen, including some of the things that were announced in the president's uh, budget release just a couple weeks ago. So we'll start with, you know, currently authorized, like what's, what are the key things folks should be paying attention to? And why don't we start with Michelle, because I know you have <laughs> a lot pending. Yeah, thanks Maria. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, we have $3 billion to give out and we have to give it out by September 30th, 2022. Um, we have, we are pretty far along in that process though, and so I'll just highlight a few things. I mentioned the Good Jobs Challenge already. The other big one that we are currently actively running right now is our $1 billion Build Back Better Regional Challenge. This is a really transformative program for us. We're thinking about investment in a different way than we have before. Traditionally, EDA had mostly given out grants in the couple million dollar range. For this program, we are really looking to invest in regional industry clusters, and we are trying to infuse between 25 to $75 million in 20 to 30 regions across the country. And so we really think that this larger investment will provide transformative change for these communities, particularly as folks are coming out of this pandemic and trying to invest in growing emerging technologies and industries. So that's one I'll highlight. Um, we are hopeful that we're going to announce the winners of those awards, um, obviously before September of 2022. The other thing I'll just highlight is that for anyone looking for um, grant opportunities, looking for economic development grants, we have what we call our Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. We have some funding through the American Rescue Plan Act. We also have funding through our regular appropriations. And this is our most flexible program. We're able to fund everything from planning to technical assistance, infrastructure, construction, workforce development. And so this is something we definitely urge folks to take a look at. This is in the smaller dollar range, so a couple million dollars, but definitely encourage you to work with your local um, economic development representative. We have one assigned to every state and territory in our country, and they will be helpful in helping you figure out the best program to apply for. Yeah, so the major programs that Michelle mentioned, the applications have already been submitted for those. I will say the department is running an extremely transparent process, which is wonderful to see. It was not like that when I was at the federal government. So you can actually see everyone who applied, who the finalists are. So you should, you know, take a look at that list. And if, you know, your area is one of the finalists, it's like... It's yeah, to start thank figuring out who they are. Excellent. Right? Thank you for mentioning that. That's actually um, a page that we took from our colleagues at the Department of Education, really trying to be really transparent about our process, about who's applied, who's making the finalist list, because we do feel like there's also important to get those applications out there so that if we can't fund them, hopefully the philanthropic community or the corporate community can pick it up as well. So Angela, let's go to you next. And I'll just say that's an example of our agencies learning from one another because when Commerce did that, we called them up and said, hey, that's really interesting. We should think about doing that with our grants too. So um, again, continuous learning from one another. So uh, we have a 
five or six right now that are open, so I'll rattle them off pretty quickly. Um, so one is the Strengthening Community Colleges grant that I mentioned earlier. This is, uh, again, focused on building the capacity of community colleges to provide high quality workforce development programs. So folks may remember um, uh, during the uh, uh, recovery after the Great Recession, uh, there was an investment um, called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College Training Grant, or TACT. <laughs> How program. could you forget? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so catchy. Um, uh, so that was a $2 billion investment in a similar uh, set of activities, and this is really building on the TACT uh, model to, to invest in community colleges because we know that they really are um, anchors in so many communities across the country. Uh, another are, is the Apprenticeship Building America funding announcement, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I think this actually speaks to our equity goals because we're experimenting a bit here with how we do the, the grant making. So um, in addition to the way that we are thinking about the substance of our grants, we've also been thinking a lot about the process. How do we bring new grantees into the fold by having longer open periods, by um, uh, making sure that community-based organizations are more, uh, uh, our grants are more accessible to community-based organizations. And so as part of that, um, in our Apprenticeship Building America funding announcement, we actually have four different tracks. I've been calling this the choose your own adventure um, because there are different types of stakeholders that can apply for different types of funding. So we're funding apprenticeship hubs, we're funding uh, uh, um, uh, equity partnerships, we're funding states to do capacity building, uh, and we're funding uh, technical assistance as well. And so I think one of the things we're really excited about is one, it'll give us an opportunity to see where the demand is for our grants to inform future grant making, but two, it allows us, since we have a limited pot of money that we can award every year, um, to spread it around to more organizations to, to really see this model across the country. Um, a couple others I'll quickly mention. Uh, we have two reentry uh, grants that are uh, open right now. So one um, is called Pathway Home. Uh, this is using an evidence-based model of providing pre- and post-release services for people who are exiting state or local incarceration. Um, and the idea is to smooth that transition back into community, um, reduce recidivism, and also ensure that formerly incarcerated people get good jobs at the end of these programs. Um, second is the Growth Opportunities uh, uh, funding announcement. This is a relatively new one for us. Uh, this year, um, and this uh, pilots a community violence intervention model, um, something that our colleagues in the White House have lifted up as something that's effective um, for young people who are in communities that experience violence. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. Um, and then uh, one other one that I'll mention is a smaller grant, but it uh, I think is worth mentioning, our Workforce Pathways for Youth, um, which is focused on funding national organizations that provide services, uh, out of school time services for young people uh, across the country. Uh, and then coming up, we'll have the Work Opportunities in Rural Communities, which we do in partnership with the Appalachian Regional Commission and the Delta Regional Authority, um, that is focused on workforce development activities in those two areas, uh, because we know that rural communities really have unique needs. Um, I should say, in addition to the discretionary dollars, um, I maybe should have mentioned this at the beginning, the Department of Labor Labor and my agency um, also funds the publicly uh, the public workforce investment system. So, um, if you know the American Job Centers, sometimes go by a different name in your communities. Um, but that network across the country, we fund states, which then fund localities uh, to provide services to job seekers across the country. So we do have these discretionary grants that we or award directly to organizations, but we also do have a really major investment in that uh, foundational workforce investment uh, that happens across the country uh, through uh, through local and state boards. So um, I'll pause there and turn over to Jim. Um, well, I would just, um, I'll, I'll focus first on kind of the big, uh, the big effort that's been going on in the department um, really since um, the beginning of the administration or close to when we passed the American Rescue Plan. Um, and that's the $122 billion that has gone out to the K-12 system um, to support students um, and make, uh, throughout the recovery, make sure that school districts have what they need um, to address loss in instructional time. And we know there's just a lot of really amazing work going on with those dollars across the country um, and that school districts and teachers and others are just um, really thinking creatively about how to um, help our students um, as we build back. Um, the other piece I would like to highlight also from the American Rescue Plan um, is the $40 billion that went out to institutions of higher education uh, through the HERF Fund. Um, it was the largest investment in history um, to go to uh, some of the traditionally under-resourced institutions. Um, and those dollars have gone to both uh, students um, by way of emergency grants and also to institutions themselves. And we're seeing some really amazing 
uh, work happening at institutions to support students um, using those dollars. So schools have used the dollars to uh, discharge institutional debt to make sure that students can stay in school um, and uh, persist. They've used those dollars to support students' mental health. Um, they've, they've used those dollars to create new slots for childcare so that student, par student parents um, can remain enrolled. So there's some, some really exciting things happening across the country uh, through the American Rescue Plan efforts. Um, a couple of other things I'll mention, or at least one other thing I'll mention that I'm particularly excited about. Um, as I mentioned, next year we'll see um, Pell expand to um, incarcerated students and eligible prison education programs. In the meantime, we are actually expanding what's called the Second Chance Pell Experimental Site. Um, which offers um, that opportunity in the meantime to a more limited set of institutions, but we're actually growing that set of institutions to up to 200 programs. Um, and we plan to announce this spring the additional um, institutions as well. So. And so how about what's on the horizon? What are you hoping Congress will enact in the next, say, nine months or so? Okay. I'm happy to start. I think we have a long wish list. Yes. But <laughs> um, so I know one thing that is uh, high in our minds, and I know we're thinking about um, or waiting to see what we see, um, but certainly uh, the president proposed a major investment in workforce development and a number of other areas through the Build Back Better uh, agenda last year. Of course, that's something that's still being negotiated in Congress, but again, there were really major transformative investments uh, included in there, and we are looking forward to when that does pass. Um, but uh, I, I would say that's one. Uh, two, something that's, uh, I think, high on my mind and Jen's mind this week uh, is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So this is uh, uh, the legislation that authorizes many of the programs at the Department of Labor and at the Department of Education. Um, it's up for reauthorization. Um, Congress actually just, the House Education and Labor Committee actually just released uh, their bill uh, last Thursday, um, which we were very excited to see. Uh, they are uh, marking it up, so they're meeting uh, tomorrow in committee uh, to review the bill um, and offer amendments, so we'll be paying very close attention to that. But again, that is a priority piece of legislation for uh, our department, for the administration, because it does uh, have an impact on so many of the workforce investment, workforce development investments that we make. Um, and then I'll just mention two other things that we are very interested in. So um, in addition to um, the uh, programs authorized by WIOA, um, uh, the Department of Labor and my office oversees uh, uh, registered apprenticeship programs and trade adjustment assistance for workers who have lost their jobs as a result of foreign trade. Um, both of those programs are up for reauthorization. Uh, National Apprenticeship Act has been up um, it was last authorized in 1937, so we are slightly overdue. Um, it's like a three-line statute, so we're looking forward to getting some more uh, uh, statutory language uh, associated with that program. Um, and then trade adjustment um, is uh, actually up for termination um, if Congress doesn't uh, act soon. So um, that's something that is included in the House passed version of the Competes Act, um, which focuses on a number of areas of priority on top competition. So that's something that we're watching very closely as well. And the Competes Act also is where the expansion of Pell to include short-term credentials is. Is that right? So that's the... Yes, that is right. Yes. So maybe we should turn to Jen. Is that, like, is that on your list to mention? Um, I was actually going to dig into a couple of things in the president's budget proposal that came out last Monday. So um, in addition to the... Um, to the things that Angela mentioned, which we're all, we're, we are very excited about. Um, just two things I wanted to highlight, um, given that we're, we're running short on time. Um, the first is the president's commitment to doubling the Pell Grant. Um, so uh, we've made some progress. So in fiscal year 22, um, we saw an increase of $400 to the maximum Pell Grant. Um, and in uh, the president's budget last Monday that we released, we included um, a proposal to increase that number um, by uh, over $2,000. Um, so we're, we're working toward that commitment. It's something that we're um, really excited to and take very seriously um, and um, we think is critical to providing affordable pathways to college for, for millions of students. Um, the second um, is one that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, so it's something that um, the secretary talks a lot about. Um, and um, is really passionate about. So, uh, and that's uh, rethinking and reimagining 
the connections between the K-12 system, the higher education system, and um, careers. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that we're thinking about across our programs at the department, um, working with our K-12 colleagues, with our higher education colleagues in the adult education space. Um, and our, in our budget proposal last week, we included um, a new proposal to support um, career-connected high schools. And the idea here is that um, we would provide uh, discretionary grants to partnerships of um, K-12 districts, of colleges, and employers um, to make sure that those partnerships are working together to include key elements of what it takes to make those connections happen. So those are things like providing equi equitable work-based learning and dual enrollment opportunities, um, career counseling so that students know what's available to them, um, opportunities to pursue industry credentials, and really embedding those connections across those systems um, in a real way. And so, yeah, you know, the idea is that students graduate with um, with an industry credential, they graduate with workforce experience, um, and they graduate with college credits, and they graduate with a plan. Um, and they, they sort of had those opportunities early on to make those connections. So it's something that's in our budget proposal, it's something we're really excited about, and we're also excited about thinking about, thinking about that across our programs, um, not just in that proposal. And I'll just highlight two things that we at the Economic Development Administration at Commerce are excited about. I think one is what Angela mentioned, the Competes Act. Um, from our perspective, list legislation would authorize investments in regional uh, revitalization that is really important for us. And it would allow us to be able to invest in technology and innovation hubs that would really have a focus on inclusive recovery. And so that's something that we're eyeing very closely. The second thing is, also reauthorization, we haven't been as long as you all, but for the Economic Development Administration, we haven't been reauthorized in 17 years. And obviously the communities that we are serving have changed a lot and that the things that they're facing have, have altered a, quite a bit in those 17 years. And so some of the key things that we're looking at is to improve the, the conditions for a lot of these distressed communities that we work with. And also one of the things that we've put into our reauthorization is what we call the eBridge Act, which would provide us the opportunity to be able to invest in more broadband en enhancement, which we know is a critical need in a lot of communities across our country. So I know we have a few minutes left, and so I thought we could do kind of a final round around a call to action. So folks who are here in the audience or folks who are going to be tuning in online later, how should they be engaging? Like, how can they best kind of be involved in the federal policy process at this point? I'm happy to start. Um, so just a couple of things. So I think, you know, we've talked a lot today about partnership and partnership is really both at the core of what we do together, but also um, at the core of what we do as agencies when we make investments across the country. So I think regardless of whether you're an employer or an educational institution, uh, a workforce board, um, partnerships are really critical to ensuring that uh, workers are getting the quality services um, that lead to jobs that are in demand. And so um, I think my, my first ask call to action would be, um, if you're an employer, partner with your workforce boards, partner with your uh, institutions of higher education, you should apply for our grants, um, uh, regardless of what type of stakeholder you are, um, but that partnership is really important. I would say similarly for institutions of higher ed, for workforce boards, um, doing outreach to employers that are hiring, that are hiring for workers and hiring them into good jobs, um, making sure that you're building those pathways, um, offering things like supportive services that can help people who are marginalized um, actually get a job and keep a job. Um, so I think that that partnership theme is critically important. It is the number one thing that I think we are often trying to seed with our grant making. Um, so as much as you um, can sort of build those connections, use them as you apply for our, our investments at Commerce or Ed um, or at the Department of Labor, uh, that is uh, very exciting for us to see and leads to the type of quality outcomes that we all hope for. And I'll just foot stomp that. We at the EDA, like I mentioned, we have had so much demand for the grant programs that we have, and we just recognize we can't fund everything. And so we really are looking for strategic partnerships, whether that's other funders, other federal agencies, because what that has told us is that 
across our country, there is huge demand for resources and funding and investment, and we can't do this alone. And so that's where it's really important for us to work together with the broader community. And so that's something that we definitely want to do. I think the other thing is, I'll just mention, if you are a community or an organization in a community looking for funding, I urge you to work with your local economic development representative. You can find their contact information at eda.gov backslash contact, and also your economic development district for resources as well. I mean, I think the, the focus on local partnership is so critical. We talked about the American Rescue Plan where school districts and institutions of higher education um, are engaging in efforts right now. Um, we talked about the bipartisan infrastructure law where those dollars are gonna start going out the door and there's gonna be you know, a demand for workforce development and there's gonna be so much work to do there as well. So I would echo the focus on partnership. I also, our deputy secretary is in the audience and I've heard her say so many times, the Department of Education is a service organization and so partnership with us. So feel free, we would love to talk to you um, and make sure that we're connecting to the community and to um, all the resources and supports that we wanna make sure um, that you all are engaged in, so. Well, I just wanna say that you know all of us as a field are so fortunate to have the three of you in these leadership roles at these agencies. I mean, you've done remarkable work in your prior roles in the ecosystem, and I know I was just thrilled when each of your announcements came out, because I can't think of a better team to be moving this work forward. So thank you for coming to DC to join us today. Thank you all for joining us in the audience. And, um, I know they want to turn over this room quickly, so if folks want to talk to our panelists, we're going to be out in the hallway, so rather than lining up here. So thank you very much. Thank you.